welcome to this edition of Birkbeck Inspires. Uh, I'm Julian Swan, Pro Vice Master of Research at Birkbeck and also Professor of History. And it's a real pleasure today to invite an old friend, Sir Richard Evans, a Professor of History at Birkbeck from uh, 1989 to 1998, who uh, subsequently went on to a highly distinguished career, Professor and uh, Regis Professor indeed at uh, the University of Cambridge and um, the author of a great range of books on German history um, from the 19th century. Richard was also involved in the famous Irving trial and um, uh, featured, as some of you may have seen, in the um, uh, uh, subsequent film of that, uh, of that trial. But it's a great pleasure to talk to Richard today because we're going to discuss Eric Hobsbawm. Eric Hobsbawm, one of the, um, I think, uh, outstanding historians of the 20th century, and somebody who um, had a long lifetime link with Birkbeck, both as a professor of history and indeed in due course as president of the college. Um, a great intellectual, Eric, and somebody, of course, who had many other interests, uh, political and, of course, cultural. He was a, a critic of jazz. Anyway, that's, he's our uh, source of discussion today, a topic of discussion. Um, but before we start, Richard, um, how are you and um, how have you been finding life under lockdown? Uh, I'm fine. Thank you, Julian. And just to correct you on one thing, um, I count my professorship and vice mastership at Birkbeck as already distinguished. It didn't, my career didn't just become distinguished when I went to Cambridge. Um, I'm very fond indeed of, of Birkbeck um, and it's really great to be back. And um, I've been living in lockdown for three months now, but we live in a countryside in North Hertfordshire since I retired from Cambridge. And there are lots of lovely walks around and nice views and the big garden so and I've got plenty to do so um, it, it, I'm surviving but I miss of course like everybody things like cinema theatre concerts opera all that kind of thing exhibitions haven't been to London since February so um, I miss that too. All right well I'm glad to hear you're still thriving and of course that's the problem with you when I um, start uh, going through your list of achievements um, I always miss some out and of course quite right to your link <laughs> as uh, both acting master and, uh, uh, and vice master a long period of Birkbeck uh, but that makes me think because obviously um, you know your career is very much defined as a historian of Germany you began early on working on the history of uh, German feminism um, and then moved on through um, you know, a whole variety of topics. But you know, perhaps most people will, will think of your work associated with the rise and fall of the Third Reich. And so given that you, you know, chose such big themes and big topics, what made you, you know, why were you attracted to the idea of writing a biography of, uh, of, a, of a fellow historian? Well, um, H.P. Taylor says somewhere that biography is not history, but every historian should try it once. And uh, I hadn't thought about it at all, but uh, at Birkbeck, of course, you have to teach quite a wide range of things. And I gave for um, some years the standard lecture course on Europe in the 19th and 20th centuries, 24 lectures, if I remember rightly. <clears throat> and in 2016, I published, based a lot on those and other lectures with a lot of new stuff, of course, a book called The Pursuit of Power, which is Penguin History of Europe, uh, 1815 to 19. 1914. So I covered much the same areas as Eric Hobsbawm did, apart from Latin America where he had an interest, but otherwise he focused mainly on Europe, Britain in the 19th and 20th centuries. And uh, then I'm kind of uh, more sympathetic than most, I would say, to his politics. I was never a communist like he was. I always thought of myself as a social democrat, but I can try and understand him from, from the left, even if I don't share some of his views. And uh, what happens when you, because uh, I hadn't thought about it, but when you die, if you're a fellow of the British Academy, uh, you get an obituary. It's called a biographical memoir. And some of these are really quite serious uh, pieces of scholarship. Mostly they use the private papers of the individual, such as they are. So when the British Academy asked me to write the biographical memoir of Eric Hobsbawm after he died in 2012, I... Um, I went to his house. I said yes, I couldn't say no. I went to his house and on the top floor there were papers, books, piled sky high on the floor, notebooks, files, um, a huge amount of material, a lot of it uh, completely unknown and completely unpublished. He never threw anything away and 
he uh, lived to the age of 95. So there's an enormous amount of material there. So I came back with a PhD student and we spent three days digitizing all the handwritten stuff. And um, I realized, I discovered his diaries, for example, uh, which ran from 1934 to 1951. And um, I discovered lots of letters and lots of amazing material. So I thought this is worth a full scale biography. Uh, not just the memoir, I wrote the memoir for the Academy. Uh, and uh, I, I got, I took some advice from uh, people I know who'd written biographies. And they said, first of all, get unrestricted access to the material. And secondly, get exclusive access to the material so that nobody else is going to steal your thunder. So I did, feeling slightly more ruthless than I wanted to be, but I could see the point. So I got uh, the family to sign a contract and they were incredibly supportive. And then I got a grant from the Lieberhume Trust to pay researchers, um, not stuff I couldn't do, but stuff to make it faster, uh, apart from reading Portuguese and um, Spanish and, and particularly Italian, which I couldn't read, but otherwise I could cope with the French and German. And uh, I got people to research in Brazil, in the United States, in, um, in all kinds of, in Italy, all kinds of different places, uh, because I wanted to put the book in the hands of his widow, who, who's in her 80s. So there's this, I had a sense of urgency about the whole thing. Um, so that's really why I, why I wrote it. And it was amazing, amazing discoveries uh, of all sorts of extraordinary material. And I wanted to kind of uh, link his life to his work, because in his own autobiography, Interesting Times, it's nearly all about his public face and I wanted to look at the private man as well. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, he had such a long life. I mean, I remember the 90th uh, uh, celebration uh, yep. we held for him in Birkbeck. And um, of course, he was born, as I recall, in 1917. Um, and so grew up, grew up, obviously, against the background of the establishment of the USSR and, of course, the, the rise of Nazism uh, mm. in Germany. I mean, how do you think, you know, from a biographical point of view, you mentioned the fact that in 1934 he started writing diaries. I mean, how did those great events impact on the, the, young, the young Hobsbawm in terms of his, you know, his life, his attitude to life, politics, and, and even history? Yeah, well, he was a, uh, he was a Jewish background, secular. Um, his family descended from uh, a, a, a Polish Jewish immigrant to London in the 1870s and so um, he was British, he was a British citizen uh, but uh, his parents died when he was very really quite young uh, and he uh, even before that they had decided to live in Vienna because uh, Eric Hobson's mother came from a family that was better off than his father's family who were Londoners uh, so he grew up in Vienna uh, and then his parents died and he had to move to Berlin. Uh, so when he, when he was in his mid-teens and in Berlin, of course, it was, there was a massive communist presence. The communists could put a hundred thousand people onto the streets at a few hours notice. They had a hundred members in the German national parliament, the Reichstag. Uh, and as a, he was known at school as the English boy, the Englander, uh, and uh, that made him feel a bit of an outsider, but also he was a, um, he was Jewish and so he couldn't possibly support the Nazis. Uh, the liberals were finished really, nobody took them seriously in the early 1930s. And again, the conservative uh, politicians, political groups were all anti-Semitic. So he felt he didn't have any choice except to become a communist. And he met a uh, communist, he had a communist school friend. He, he started reading communist literature. And uh, so he, and he saw, this is only like, you know, 1917 to 1932 is, is only, uh, it's 15 years. So it's quite recent that you had the Bolshevik revolution. And right across Europe in the left and even among liberals, there was a sympathy for the Soviet Union as building a new kind of society. It wasn't, it was just at the beginning of Stalinism, but before Stalin's great crimes, murders, purges, show trials, and so on. So he became a communist, and he it was really when his family's, his uncle, with whom he lived in Berlin, his uncle's 
business collapsed and they went to stay with the rest of the family in England. Uh, and he went to school in England that he started to read seriously Marxist literature. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I, I obviously, um, when you think about Eric, obviously he was synony synony synonymous in many ways with Marxism. Um, and I've, I've often, often wondered whether or not that kind of, if you like, set of ideological blinkers was something which rather restricted him as, in, mm. as a historian, limited perhaps his creativity, or, or do you disagree with that? No, I, I, I disagree. I mean, you can see there's a, 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 I mean, there's a number of different things in his life and his background that made him a great historian, I think. And one is the ability to ask big questions and give uh, very well-organized, conceptually sophisticated, but clear answers. And if you look through his career, he becomes kind of less Marxist as things times go on. If you look at The Age of Revolution, his first big book, it's very much a Marxist book. You can see Lenin there in various accounts of the French Revolution and so on. But as time went on, it became progressively less dogmatic, if you might, you might say. And he was, for most of his career, he was not a dogmatic Marxist at all uh, <clears throat> in his historical writing. And he, his ability to conceptualize made him uh, an extraordinarily original thinker who devised lots of concepts historians have found very useful or interesting or debatable. The general crisis of the 17th century, the long 19th century, the short 20th century, social banditry. Um, the, the, there's a whole uh, primitive rebels. There are many, many different concepts. I mean, the, the literature on history of banditry is still dominated by his, his work, either reacting against it or, or, or following it or amending it half a century or more later. So that's one reason why his work has lasted. And secondly is he could write, he could write brilliantly and really well. And that's due partly to his mother, who is a novelist and translator in Vienna from English into German, and who taught him English. He insisted he spoke English at home, even in Vienna. So his school reports, which I got hold of, um, show uh, that his language is um, uh, used down as bilingual English and German. Um, and he, he read very widely, even as a teenager, he, in his diaries, his, his handwritten diaries in German, he uh, has a, uh, a weekly list of his reading and it's absolutely terrifying. It's, it's kind of Marxist theory, French poetry, Renaissance drama, huge novels. It's just vast. So he, he sort of imbibed literature in his teenage years. In that sense, he was always more than a Marxist. If you look at standard Marxist work, they're all rather kind of rigid and boring. And, but he always had this literary style of expression and, and, and very wide, wide reference. No, I'm sure you're right. I think that's what is the breadth and the range, isn't it, that really makes him stand out yeah. as, a, as, a, as a great historian. Um, and, it, and I agree as well. I mean, I, I, I can think back to my own undergraduate days when reading some of his earlier works and how he gradually over time as you say, did, did move away from, yeah. from the Marxism. And yet that raises the question, of course, because in his private life, I suspect for a lot of people, you know, will have, will have heard the term, uh, I mean, name Hobsbawm, and they think uh, communist, uh, and they think of his political beliefs. Um, and I suppose for his critics, you know, you'd say, here we have a classic example of the Hampstead Bollinger Bolshevik, uh, somebody who had, you know, neither an understanding of the working class nor empathy for the victims of communism. You know, he never renounced communism. I mean, is that mm. fair? There's something in that, yes. Um, you know, I don't, it, it's a, I'm sympathetic in the biography, but I don't try and hide the, the, the more uh, controversial or disagreeable or negative aspects of his, either his character or, or what he did. The, the literary editor, the New Statesman, when she wanted to um, uh, hire him to write reviews, went to his house in Hampstead, a, a really nice three-story house with the heath at the end of the road. And uh, she said she was very, very surprised uh, because she was expecting an ascetic, grim kind of uh, <laughs> Marxist uh, place. And it was actually full of the bourgeois cultures, a slightly Viennese atmosphere. So she's remarked on this to him. She said, well, said, if you're going down with a ship, meaning capitalism, we might as well go down first class, he said. So <laughs> there was something of the Champagne Socialist about him. And because he was um, very poor when he was young in Vienna, uh, 
he lived in, in his family and in sort of genteel poverty. He remembered his mother not being able to buy new shoes for him and, and going to school in the snow and, and getting uh, the snow freezing his feet, for example, because of the holes and all, having a second class, really second hand bicycle, which he was so ashamed of, he hid it um, before he went to school and walked around the corner. I mean, when he went to school, he hid the, hid the, uh, um, hid the bicycle from his fellow, uh, fellow pupils who were all arriving in this, the Berlin school in uh, very nice limos. Um, and um, he was, uh, uh, so, and he's also worried, always worried about money, um, even when he was earning really quite considerable amounts from his uh, books, which were published in more than 50 languages. Mm -hmm. His um, last book, the uh, last big history book, The Age of Extremes, sold millions of copies his, his book sold a million copies in brazil in portuguese alone so um and yet i mean i got hold of his accountant's reports which were, were quite revealing he used to claim expenses against tax um amounting to quite a lot of his income as a uh, as a writer because he would claim travel for example um so um and yet he would still in paris even in his 90s insist on taking the metro instead of taking a taxi because it was cheaper so there's, there's that worry about about income which really wasn't necessary at all in his later later years mm, yeah i mean it's, it's fascinating isn't it i mean I, what of you mentioned uh, you know the fact that books sell so widely um, mm. um global reputation i mean here is a historian as you say translated into a vast variety of mm. uh, languages mm. um you know big influence in latin america india as well and you know many other places mm. that i can cite um and revolution a big theme that runs through many of his works, uh, either actual revolutions or the yeah. uh, attempted uh, uh, failed revolutions of others. Um, mm. Did he just write about history or, or do you think that he actually influenced it in any way? Well, he was a kind of, um, to some extent, participant observer. So uh, he, he wrote in his diaries very and letters um, brilliantly about uh, the atmosphere in Berlin in, in the rise of Nazism and Hitler's takeover of power. I mean, his family, luckily for him, I think he and his family, they left just before the Nazi dictatorship was really firmly established. Uh, you're, you can see in his, can you get a sense in his writings of the desperate, violent atmosphere that, that you took your life in your hands if, if the Nazis found you were a communist on the streets, for example. And he writes wonderfully about the euphoria of the French Popular Front uh, the Bastille Day in, in 1936. Um, he writes about the Spanish Civil War. He went into Spain, met some anarchists, and you know, was actually rushed out at gunpoint by the anarchists who didn't like the communists. Um, and, and many other things, his service in the war, which was uh, actually controlled by MI5, so he didn't actually get to fight or leave the country or anything. Cold War in the 50s, all kinds of things like that. Um, so uh, he was, um, he, he did write about politics but the only time in which you can say he really influenced politics i think and even now it's somewhat disputed i mean you don't know quite how much but was in the 19 in the 1980s uh, he was always very practical he if you think of the sort of two on, on the left there are some who want i say like jeremy corbyn and his supporters momentum who are mostly concerned about keeping the ideology pure, as it were, and those who are willing to compromise, um, like Tony Blair, in order to achieve power, because you can be as ideologically pure as you like on the left, but if you don't seize power, that doesn't have any effect. And, and Eric was definitely that on that camp. He even canvassed for the Labour Party, despite being a communist, in the 1945 general election, because the communists in Britain had no hope at all of, of gaining power, and he thought you could influence um, the Labour Party push it to the left from within. Yeah, and in the 1980s, he, he, was, um, he wrote this famous or notorious article called The Forward, La Forward March of Labour Halted, question mark, uh, which said that um, the traditional working class, the industrial working class was actually declining. And so the Labour Party to, keep, to, to achieve power had to cement class alliances with elements of the bourgeoisie, is how he would Put it. And this was taken up by Neil Kinnock and then by Tony Blair. Uh, so, I mean, as soon as Tony Blair became Prime Minister, that's when Eric Hobson was offered a knighthood. But as he told me, 
he said he'd, his old comrades would never forgive him. He became a knight. And Blair knew this, so he got a companionship of honor, uh, which is a small and distinguished order, um, as an alternative. He said, if Jack Jones, a trade union leader, can become a CH, I can too. It's for the awkward squad, he said. <laughs> no, that's, that's a, a, a lovely image. I mean, obviously, I mean, mem memories of, of his career, I mean, at the time I knew him from, from mm. the 1980s, I mean, he, he gradually uh, it sort of uh, evolved, I suppose, into being kind of a grand old man of, of, of history, mm. and, and those who had been very suspicious of him um, gradually, I think, softened on, on, on the, in terms of their attitude to him, and you mentioned mm. Tony Blair in that context. Uh, uh, but I, I was thinking, I mean, I, I remember, you know, right towards the end of his life, we had the 2008 um, financial crash. And suddenly mm -hmm. Eric was very much back in vogue. He was somebody who was on the radio and the yeah. television, yeah. particularly radio, particularly talking about what this financial crash meant for the future of capitalism and so on. Yeah. And so forth. Yeah. Um, sadly, of course, we haven't got him with us now. How do you think he would, he, he would react to COVID and, the, and, and how states uh, have, re, have reacted to it? Yeah. He, uh, because he was enough of a Marxist to say uh, that things that happen happen because of the way society develops. And of course, both climate change, and he ruled that out uh, as any, having any effect on society because it was an extraneous factor. Uh, I don't think he quite saw the way which is bound up with the nature of human society, indeed the nature of capitalism. And I think he would have again tried to link COVID-19, the coronavirus, to the development of capitalism. That's not really very, very easy, but I think globalization comes into it. I'm sort of trying to work out how he would think about it now. You try and integrate it into an analysis of, of society. So uh, it's COVID-19, it's the way that uh, humanity, particularly business, deals uh, with the environment, to say it's very intrusive and very damaging. He, he, he try and look at it in, in that kind of way. Of course, in the crash of 2008, uh, that was, uh, as you said, something that enthused him enormously. Um, he actually thought finally capitalism was collapsing and I think there's a lot of wishful thinking there. <laughs> yes, it's still with us and I suspect it'll still be with us even after uh, the, the pandemic. Um, but um, I mean, obviously, you know, we could continue to talk for hours, but uh, time is starting to press. So I, I wondered, obviously, it's great now to have you back at Birkbeck as an honorary professor in the history department. Mm. Um, now that you're back, um, do you sort of, you know, look when you're looking at, at the, the way in which the uh, college and indeed particularly the history department functions, do you see any signs of a legacy of, uh, of Eric Hobsbawm? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I also tried to follow this when I was um, chair, of, chair of the history department back in the 90s. It's astonishing to think it's sort of nearly, nearly 30 years ago. <laughs> um, but yes, I do. I mean, I certainly tried and I think others have tried to, to um, uh, follow in making appointments and in setting up courses, follow Eric Hobsbawm's legacy of teaching a kind of history that unites and brings together social history, economic history, political history, cultural history, all of those, those things and looks at their relationship. So uh, not, in other words, hard edge, econometric, um, statistical economic history, not conventional diplomatic history and history of international relations, but in a much kind of broader way. And I think that legacy is, is still there. And Birkbeck has mostly been a place where uh, people on the left uh, kind to tend to um, uh, converge on because of its mission to teach adults, part-time students, ordinary people in other words, and, and not the kind of students that I'm afraid I was teaching in Cambridge for some years after I left Birkbeck, although uh, they were absolutely brilliant and, and really good, but not terribly diverse. Uh, which is re one reason why I became president of Wolfson College, which is a graduate college. Um, most, nearly all mature students, 94 different nationalities, ethnically incredibly diverse and so on. I felt slightly more comfortable there than I did, um, uh, you know, in, in a kind of conventional Cambridge. So I think uh, Eric Colson's legacy has, has continued in many different ways. Though, of course, there have been conservatives in, in um, in, in, in Birkbeck. I don't know if that includes you, Jules. Um, no, it's but it, not. <laughs> <laughs> it to be, I think, or as I remember. Um, but uh, with people like Roger Scruton, for example, as a professor of, of philosophy. So, 
it is, it is very broad, but it, there is a kind of left wing uh, character to it, which I think grows out of its the nature of what Birkbeck does. Um, yeah, yes, and I'm sure you're right. But yeah, and as a, you know, Eric Hodgson got a job there in 1947 uh, and carried on there till 2012, which was an unsurpassed record, ending as president, of course. Um, uh, and he had an extraordinary loyalty to to Birkbeck and was he used to call it the poor man's all souls. And all souls is, is a, a Oxford College where there are no students, and so people research and write all the time. He said you could do that during the day in Birkbeck, unlike other other universities. No, I'm sure you're right. The diversity of, of Birkbeck is, you know, one of the things that has always attracted and kept us here. And the fact that you've come back to us, I think, is a sign of that. And um, <laughs> it's good to see that you can still see a legacy from uh, uh, Eric's yeah. work. And um, as, as you know, we, we have an annual lecture and yeah. also a, a studentship fund um, that is yeah, set up in his name that has been yeah. um, you know, very much uh, welcome and part of continuing that legacy. Yeah.